Maris. Um, hi, everyone. Thank hi. you for joining us tonight for a very, very special Inauguration Day Pigeon Pages poetry event. Um, and thank you to McNally Jackson for facilitating this historic evening. I know you all could be doing anything right now, and I'm very honored that you're here with us. And I'm so thrilled to have three amazing authors with us this evening to share their work, along with the brief moderated Q&A at the end. And so as Mara said, there will be links to buy books from our authors tonight directly from McNally Jackson. I really encourage you to do so. Um, the pandemic isn't over and independent bookstores like McNally Jackson really do benefit from your shopping now and always. If you already own copies of these books, buy them for your friends. And lastly, a couple of announcements before we get to our amazing readers. Um, one, if you wanna help support Pigeon Pages, you can donate to us. We'll get a link in the chat to make it easy for you and donations help make it possible to pay our contributors, fund our contests and other good stuff like that. And two, for all the poets out there, now that you are here listening to this magical evening, our annual poetry contest is going on right now through February 15th, judged by the incredible Natalie Diaz, <laughs> author of When My Brother Was an Aztec and Post-Colonial Love Poem. And Hannah Bay, one of our wonderful editors, has again put together a group funding initiative to cover submission fees for Black writers for this contest. So if that applies to you or a writer you know, please reach out to us. A submission for the contest is $7. And if you'd like to claim $7 to cover your contest submission fee, you can send a request for $7 via PayPal to pigeonpagesnyc at gmail.com. But if you're listening to me and you're like, I've already forgotten this, that's okay. You can message Pigeon Pages on social. You can message me. You can message Hannah Bay on Twitter. We will help you out. Again, the contest closes February 15th and we are always open for general submissions. So bring us your beautiful work. And with that, thank you so much again for being with us. I'm very excited to introduce our first amazing reader of the night. Jiyun Yun is a Korean American poet from the San Francisco Bay Area. Winner of the 2019 Prairie Schooner Prize in Poetry, her debut collection, Summer Always Hungry, was published by University of Nebraska Press in September, 2020. A Fulbright Research Fellow, she received her MFA in poetry from New York University. Her work has appeared in Best New Poets, Adroit, Narrative Magazine, Poetry Northwest, and elsewhere. She currently resides in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Thanks. Thank you so much for that introduction. <laughs> Happy Goodbye 45 Day, everybody. Um, uh, so first of all, thank you so much to Pigeon Pages, McNally Jackson um, for of course having us and I'm just uh, so honored, I can't really articulate how honored I am to be reading with Terrence Hayes and Sharon Olds who are, you know, poetry heroes, of course, and um, who's, who I've um, taken classes with um, during NYU. <laughs> so um, I'm super excited, it feels like doubly an honor. So I'm just gonna read um, four short poems because I can't wait to, to hear them read. <laughs> So I'm going to read some poems from my debut collection. And this first one is um, a poem that I dedicated to my mom. Um, of course, like a lot of other people, I haven't been able to see my family in over a year because of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And I kind of feel like if I um, read a poem about my mother, it almost feels like she's here with me. <laughs> so this poem is called Thirst. Mornings of marrow and oolong oiled mother of pearl from too much milk. This is how we heal. Fingers, sugar tacky. We eat the day cloudless. Watch mayflies thrust upwards to a blue the hue of thirst. Your lip, a crushed berry, spills its wet cerise. You say, even this can be inherited, by which you mean be strong. Azalea in baby's breath, drop petals on the nightstand like flies' eggs. Through your bent nose, your voice, mosquitoes as you sing, man is ship, woman is harbor. Day by day, I gaze towards the sea. But we are landlocked beasts. Mother, I too envy any selfish thing. Ooh, nerves. <laughs> um, this next poem is called All Female. It's the opening poem from my collection. 
At the night markets, women peddle their prices, shout in swift Cantonese over gurgling tanks of sea spawn, snails, young eels born for smoke, coal, skewers. The blood clams loll, tongues over shell lips as we buy a bag of cockles and three crabs sweet with egg. Their claws beg, puncture holes in the cherry red, please come again. At home, my woman crack them open, cleave the lips hem, plunge and snap. The men watch game shows as we wreck the girl bodies for row and I don't know why. They are always sweeter, more pricey, Harmony says, pulling the last claw from the last crab stumps still writhing in the sink. She dismantles the breast next and what pulsates inside is all gully and wet. It's always the girls for everything. When was the last time you've heard of rooster soup? We put the bodies to boil in salt and broth. Outside, the winter interrogates, our windows fogged. If our feast ever happens, if time has not misplaced us, may these girls rise violet from the pot, untangle their legs from perilla and leek, and make for the sea with their limbs and their teeth. Um, oh, I forgot to, to thank mm -hmm. uh, all the audience for coming. Thank you so much. I see so many um, familiar and well-loved names too in the audience, so. Um, this poem is called Reversal, and my book was kind of um, structured around a series of recipe poems for various Korean um, recipes, and this one is a, a reverse recipe poem. Rescind the palm dash of scallion, the final blessings of ground perilla seed and sesame leaf. Unshred the crown daisy. Take the soup off the flame and kill the flame. Unsinge the bottom of the pot until your face reflects in its gunmetal glint. Decorean the broth. Vacate its ginger and onion and garlic, its rice wine and red swelter. Restore the ground chili flakes to their unshorn forms and hang the bloodless red fruit back up in their perennials. Unwater the perennials, vines retreating to the crease of their seeds. Commit yourself to this unharvest, to the joy of unmaking. Let the soup unthicken, the starch pull back into the cells of their russets. Fish the russets out from the pork spine cages and lay them to rest back into the earth. Now, address the spines. Pick them out from the pot and lay them to grow raw across the cutting board's face. Watch it pull blood back into itself replenish its own marrow. Love, you'll need your shoes for this. Leave the kitchen, seek the sow and unslaughter her. But if you find the pig dismembered and cannot bear it, grant yourself permission to not tend to her rememberment. Remember, just because you're a daughter doesn't mean you must mend. Instead, let her tend to herself her unthatched belly calling for return of lost things, bone, honeycomb maw, her clumsy animal heart until she speaks. Dear reader, I so want to survive this. Please lead me whole into another season so I may dare begin again. Um, Amazing. Uh, thank you so much. I'm going to end on one short poem. It's a, a very new poem, so I haven't had the opportunity to read it aloud yet to anybody, but it's a poem that's dedicated to my father-in-law who passed away last week um, with complications of esophageal cancer. And um, of course, because of COVID, I didn't really get to honor him um, in the way that I wanted to. But in this poem, I kind of hope to create a space where we can exist um, together for one last time. It's called Prognosis as Double Exposed Film for CK. One, pneumonia, sepsis, mass in esophagus, inability to swallow, multiple lung nodules, protein calorie malnutrition, 
abscess after procedure, bacterial infection in blood, feeding tube complications, abscess of abdominal wall, systemic inflammatory response syndrome, necrosis of throat at site of tumor. Does he understand? In Korean, please tell him. Two, here is a photograph of not grief, a garden hushed with Queen Anne's lace to grant us longer this amber hour between possibility and knowing, I transpose the image of a man kneeling over the crabgrass and call him you. No longer your day slivered into fourth hour tube feeds, morphine, syringe. Father, sling your umbilical wet tether aside, the horror fruit of the body forgotten. You can touch the ground and say grace like you used to. Drink soup for your throat is unruined. Leave into that delicate architecture of memory. No slits crawl up the trellis of your trachea like leaves. Gone are the abscesses brailing your lungs. Every absence a gift. All I want is a dull and holy life, you'd say. The dull wonder of a life uninterrupted. Soil sundered for seed magnolias on your lap, you can have it for a time right here. Retire the slim arrow of your harm back into its quiver and walk towards the world as you dreamed it. My tongue, I've sunk in the lake beyond the garden, the lake overcome by lichen. By the time it is retrieved, you will have lived two lives. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I think that is the, I've said this before, the beauty and the curse of hosting is now I have to have words after that. Mm -hmm. And that was amazing. So thank you so much. Um, and thank you for being here after that last week. I think you were amazing. Thank you so much. Um, with that, how can you top that? Um, but we're going to try in some way to level it out uh, because we have the lovely Sharon Olds here with <clears throat> us. Sharon Olds is the author of 12 books of poetry, including most recently Arias, which was shortlisted for the 2020 Griffin Poetry Prize and Odes. Her 2012 collection, Stag's Leap, won both the Pulitzer Prize and England's T.S. Eliot Prize. Olds is the Eric Maria Remarque Professor of Creative Writing at New York University's Graduate Creative Writing Program, where she helped to found workshop programs for residents of Kohler Goldwater Hospital on Roosevelt Island and for veterans of Iraq and Afghanistan. She lives in New York City. Thank you so much, Sharon. Thank you so much for having us here. And Ji Yun, oh, I wish I could just sit with you for hours and drink tea and thank you for the beauty of your poems, which is so comforting and gives us so much energy. I, I, I remembered when you were reading the last poem, when my father who died of the same illness many, many years ago, when he was allowed to have a half teaspoon of cream. That was what he was allowed to eat. And um, thinking of mm, honoring our ancestors, which I do in a rather peculiar way. Um, but I think I come to poetry to learn about love, about what it is, and, and, um, and I learned a lot from hearing you now. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I've started doing that thing they do in Australia of um, what's called... A land acknowledgement. Yes, the land acknowledgement. I, I met it first in Australia 25 years ago. So I want to acknowledge that I'm on the 17th floor of this tall building and it is on the land. Uh, and we thank the original people of this land for um, letting us <laughs> share each other's company here tonight. I'm going to start with a, a poem from Arius, and then I'm just going to read some new poems. Um, 
I start every reading now with this, with this poem. It's called For You. In the morning, when I'm pouring the hot milk into the coffee, I put the side of my face near the convex pitcher to watch the last round drop from the spout. And it feels like being cheek to cheek with a baby. Sometimes the orb pops back up, a ball of cream balanced on a whale, watery exhale. Then I gather the tools of my craft, the cherry sounding board tray for my lap, like the writing arm of a desk, the phone, the bird book for looking up the purple Martin. I repeat them as I seek them so as not to forget. Tray, cell phone, purple Martin, tray, phone, Martin, Trayvon, Martin. Song was invented for you. All art was made for you. Painting, writing was yours. Our youngest, our most precious, to remind us to shield you. All was yours. All that is left on earth with your body was for you. <clears throat> Here's a poem, uh, uh, Me Too, a poem that I haven't ever read to anyone. As some of you know, I, I lost my dearest person about a year ago, and this poem is called Carl's Voice a Year Later. The chair seat is satin brocade, a smooth, shiny background with tenderly nosegays on it. I was sitting on it, bent forward over the old ivory plastic answer machine. 76 messages, time to let some go. The first, Sister Sonia Sanchez, melodious magi voice, save. And then Carl, 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 Carl. His resonant baritone with the nasal New York City string section, as if you could hear the size of the chambers of his gorgeous nose. Hi, Sharon, the strenuous work of his big tongue audible, no splashing, but a little skywriting as he forms the English not spoken in his house when he was a baby, only Yiddish, often screamed. It is a sensual, flavorful voice. By then we had declared ourselves. His throat had no more armor, its elevator sometimes taking him down into the basement of growled love. As the last months went by, he gave me more and more sugar, though toward the end, he had only a, a harsh salt whisper left and he put his heart into it. The whole time I am hearing him, I am broad smiling and from the brocade garden, there is a perfume rising. And this poem was written in the company of the Monday poets. And each of us five tossed three words in and all of our poems written in the next 45 minutes had most of those words. So it's a great feeling of feeling of being with my friends when I see, you know, elevator and uh, splash and skywriting. I never would have had those words in my poem were it not for my friends. Oh, now I want to read, you're keeping me on time. Now I want to read. Um, I was invited to go to Emily Dickinson's house two years ago and spend an hour alone in her room and write a poem for a show. And a week before I went there, 
I started writing in her form again, as I had done at 14 and 15 and 16 years old. So this is called Amherst Ballad One. You did not sell the bluing nor toil with it wash day, yours the cerulean of sky and brocade. And now the privilege comes to me to make my way, train, bus, subway, into your home, into your room, to look under your bed as when a child I woke under mine, not knowing why, what fear or whim, divine or profane. There may be no dust there, house become museum, but if there were, twould be the ghosts of creatures, parts of them, barbs, feet, legs, knees, arachnid, parcel be, like picnic basket member of canceled holiday. And now I ride the rails at ease who never rode for real as pilgrim and as decibel to you who made the world perceptible to us and no less perilous than temporary glory of the cannot be the stay. What beat or syncopate could tell my craving for your tale, if not the ravish counterpoint, your Calvin rock and roll. <clears throat> Do I have time for one or two? Four minutes left. Mm. Four minutes. That's good. That's good. Here's another one I've never read. It's called X-ray. When the X-ray of my hand came up, sudden and delicate on the screen, I said a little haunted, it's my mom's hand, spidery and skeletal. Then I saw the mass of my big hand around it, my mom's tiny metaphysical carpels packed in the mitt of my big girl pants lard. And I'm not going to wonder whose breast milk was richer. I was touched to see the archeology span of my maternal contents. And my thumb wasn't broken, just compromised by bruising and inspired into crisper arthritisness. I went out on the street as if with my hand in my mother's, though it was her latency thin hand in my large for a woman's hand. And on the curb was a rat. My head came up to its thick gray inflated plastic waist. Its haunches juddered at me as the hot air ran through it and kept it rampant. Fat tail along the sidewalk, clawed feet in the street, big ass, arms cocked, talons cocked, and the face fierce, pissed, savage, two front teeth fused and turgid canines and tongue painted on, and the whiskers painted back and down along the neck like terror's reins. I walked on and there was another smaller giant rat clawing across 51st, a way for the unions to speak today against a hotel where my father had stayed once as a little executive from the West Coast in a room next to the boiler. And then there were two more adult rodents menacing and shaming. I thought of my poems about my mother. She did indeed beat me, but at other times had nursed me with her full mammal breasts and fed me baby food and taken me into gardens and smiled when I lisped to the flowers. And when I could stand up, I danced with them with her blessing. I was like my mother and she liked that. I owe her better than I have given her. I'm glad I don't owe her my love. In any way, I loved her more than I loved myself. I need to honor myself more so I can bless my mother.
Oh my God, thank you so much, Sharon. That was beautiful. To be compromised, but not broken. I'm gonna have that in my head forever now. And actually my mom is in the audience. So I was just particularly invested and I know she's loving this, so thank you. And we can tell by knowing you a little, but we can give her our congratulations as a mother. Yeah. This is so beautiful. This is a good night for everybody. Thank you, people. Uh, well, with that, I mean, how can you move on from that? We have last but never ever least, Terrence Hayes. Ooh. Terrence Hayes' most recent publications include American Sonnets for My Past and Future Assassin and To Float in the Space Between Drawings and Essays in Conversation with Etheridge Knight. To Float in the Space Between was winner of the Poetry Foundation's 2019 Pegasus Award for Poetry Criticism and a finalist for the 2018 National Book Critics Circle Award in Criticism. American Sonnets for My Past and Future Assassin won the Hurston Wright 2019 Award for Poetry and was a finalist for the 2018 National Book Critics Circle Award in Poetry, the 2018 National Book Award in Poetry, the 2018 T.S. Eliot Prize for Poetry, and the 2018 Kingsley Tufts Poetry Award. <laughs> Hayes is a professor of English at New York University, and I believe we have some exciting visuals coming up as well. So thank you, Terrence. Hey everybody, uh, it's good to be here. I'm going to do this share screen. Um, I mean, part of what I've been thinking about, you know, in this space is, uh, you know, reading and writing at the same, uh, reading and uh, being in an audience, the difference between looking at a poem and hearing a poem. So you'll see some of it. But since we're gonna do a q and I'm actually just not gonna talk very much. I'm just gonna read uh, in my time here and then any questions you have, uh, I'll answer them then. I will say, you know, uh, this this first poem, which I I want to, you know, end and begin with the last of the American sonnets. This is one I thought I was when I wrote it. I thought I would never have to write another one. It was the first time I thought Trump would be, you know, put out. Uh, so it's never old yet. But I, you know, anyway. So uh, when I published it in the New Yorker, I decided I didn't like the lines with the without the capital T. So it's a little edit on it. American sonnet for the new year. Things got terribly ugly incredibly quickly. Things got ugly embarrassingly quickly, actually. Things got ugly unbelievably quickly, honestly. Things got ugly seemingly infrequently initially. Things got ugly ironically, usually awfully carefully. Things got ugly unsuccessfully occasionally. Things got ugly, mostly painstakingly, quietly, seemingly. Things got ugly beautifully, infrequently. Things got ugly sadly, especially frequently, unfortunately. Things got ugly increasingly, obviously. Things got ugly suddenly, embarrassingly, forcefully. Things got really ugly regularly, truly quickly. Things got really incredibly ugly. Things will get less ugly, inevitably, hopefully. The historic home makeover, home makeover audio guide for the White House Jasper Johns Flag Exposition. Welcome, friend. Thanks for selecting this handheld audio guide for the White House Jasper Johns Flag Exhibit. This exhibition is underwritten by citizens so desperate for change they let the recently foreclosed executive mansion be reappropriated by a riot of artists. A selection of Jasper John's celebrated flag paintings hang throughout rooms that have been transformed into dynamic art installations. Visitors are presented with colorful interactive choices throughout the tour. Warning, before entrance, you must attach a red button to your kisser, a white button to your whiffer, and a blue button to your third eye. Should you enjoy this audio guide, audio for the new Thomas Jefferson Monticello Mark Rothko exhibit is also highly recommended. Jasper John's 1957 flag in pastel, graphite, and collage on gesso board is displayed in the closet of the cabinet room. 50 stars float above dusky delphiniums fenced in by 13 rows of blood and cotton. The cabinet room holds a winding queue of visitors waiting to stand in the closet with the painting. 
the distinguished environmental artist behind this installation instructs you to pull a red lever to transform the closet into a military coffin draped in a flag, a right lever to make the closet a phone booth and the flag's Superman's cape, and a red lever to stand in the mouth of a blue whale. Please press the red button if you know what this painting says about fear. Press the white button if you know what it says about the cost of living or press the blue button if what it says changes the longer you look at it. Jasper John's 1958 flag and encaustic on canvas is displayed on t-shirts stacked on a wobbly table in the White House lobby. An urban proto-pop artist has converted the space into a gift shop. The actual Jasper John's painting is displayed behind the checkout counter. Note how much this sensational painting favors the quixotic texture of an actual flag. Postcards, as well as doormats, table mats, bath mats, loin cloths, bobby socks, baby bibs, and Bibles displaying John's image are sold in the shop. Framed replicas ship within 48 hours. Should you have the opportunity, be sure to visit the gift shop of Flank Roy Wright's Falling Water, where the innovative quilts of Faith Ringgold hang beside Sam Gilliam's draping lyrical unstraked canvases. Visit Ernest Hemingway's historic Key West home where packs of six-toed cats tiptoe below the soup cans of Andy Warhol. Jasper John's 1957 flag on orange field and fluorescent paint, watercolor, pastel, and graphite pencil on paper is displayed in the Situation Room where paintbrushes and buckets of orange paint have been placed. You are instructed to paint the walls of the room the same orange in the John's painting, while music composed by a Grammy-winning ambient sound artist trumpets from boom boxes. Smells of rubber and road, exhausted machines, gasoline and metal condition the air. A woman stands on a soapbox, really whispering, aren't you tired, and aren't you tired, into a megaphone. Please press the red button to paint the town red. Press the white button to paint picket fences or press blue to paint yourself in a corner. This viewing experience may last as long as you desire. Jasper John's 1958 three flags and encaustic on three panels is displayed in the White House family elevator at the instruction of a reclusive escape artist. His three tiers evoke the floors of the building. Only one rider is allowed on the elevator at a time. Lovers, families, tour groups, and field trippers who arrive together must wander the red and blue floors of the White House alone after this room. Your audio guide is here to help you get lost. Please press the red button if you'd like to rise up. Press the blue, press the white button if you'd like to stay put. Or press the blue button if you'd like to back down. Please press the red button to back up. Press the white button to stay the course, or press the blue button to break down. Please press the red button to wake up. Press the white button to stay the execution. Press the blue button to bear down. Study three flags during your elevator ride. You are on your own when the doors part. Thank you, friend, for listening to this historic home makeover audio guide. And uh, this is the last one. Again, just uh, this one was in New York at some point too. Uh, you know, I, I think I'm really done. You know, that's what the day means for me. Mm. I never have cause to write one of these motherfuckers again. Mm. But this is how, you know, this is my final sentiment on the whole thing, I guess, about, you know, like nothing will be correct until uh, this dude goes to jail. Until that happens, it's just going to stay broken. All right. American sonnet for my past and future assassin. Side effects include dry spells, dry coughs, dry eyes and crying, photosensitivity, blurred vision, trouble sleeping, trouble with gravity, cold feet, weight gain, weight loss, hair loss, blood lust and blood loss, memory loss, loss of appetite, belly aches, headaches, heartaches, back aches, bruises, blueness, redness, whiteness, discoloration, itching, wrinkling, slouching, lying, backbiting, a taste for metal, a taste for meddling and mixed messaging, a taste for witches brews brewed by the motherfuckers who slew all the witches. 
Side effects include blockages and blockades, a blockhead of state your business as usual, a blockhead strong arm of the law, a warhead shotgun point and shoot down fallout shelters. Side effects include nausea, dizziness, numbness, dumbness, dementias, deletions, leeches, leches, hexes, hoaxes, hocus pocuses, and if there is justice, spiritual, moral, federal, state, and local charges. Mm. <laughs> all right, y'all. I think I think Sharon said it all. Absolutely. I mean, that was visually gorgeous, emotionally gorgeous. Uh, thank you so much, Inauguration Day, people. Um, with that, if you can believe it, we have 20 minutes for Q&A, which does not feel long enough for this incredible group. Thank you so much for being here and participating. Um, as people have questions, please do put them in the chat. If they are appropriate, I will ask them. I actually, you know, I have great group questions for you all, but I want to start with one that we got via email in advance. Um, this is a Terrence question. I, I really like this given historically all that's going on today and with these sonnets, this person asked, what are the particular characteristics of the sonnet that continue to make it a relevant poetic form all these years after its inception? Uh, good question. I just always focus on the adjectives. So, you know, the English sonnet, uh, what is that, 12 lines, and then you change your mind at the last two, you get to Volta at the end of it, and then the two lines out, which seems right. If you're almost 100% right in the minute, like, oh, maybe I'm wrong. I was right for 12 lines. And then the Italian sign, again, adjective, which is what, like eight lines, right? Two octaves, then you change your mind, there's a volta, six <laughs> lines and you're out. So that's a little bit more right in terms of like, maybe how you process things. But the American sign, to me, is just like, it's up and down, it's all over the place. It keeps slipping and tripping and never really knows what it wants to do. It's unstable. So I'm just writing American sign. So I'm saying like, yeah, it's interesting for me because of the volta. So as long as something, some form is making you have to kind of change your mind, I think that's always, for me anyway, that's always going to be interesting. But um, I just say, you know, it's an American. What does that mean for you? That's going to mean something different for everybody. But, you know, that, that's how I process it. That's amazing. Thank you. Um, I like this too. I'm going to steal another one from the chat before I get to any of mine. Um, can we just, so I like, I like Amanda's, I don't have a question, more of a prompt. And I think this is a good one for tonight too. Can we just talk about Amanda Gorman and the, and the role poetry plays in healing and politics. Your take on that going into this new, but also the same time in our nation. It's a big question. So whoever is ready for that. Gian, Sharon, when y'all y'all answer, somebody says something. I've already spoken. Well, I am saving it for tomorrow. I'm saving it. My daughter uh, emailed me from Canada and said how fantastic it is. And as I said before, anyone can imagine that any daughter of mine is not going to be a fan of poetry. But she loved that poem so much. And I'm saving it for tomorrow. I love that. I don't know if I have oh, many grand thoughts about it, except for the fact that it reminded me that poetry is like a very big reason um, for me to remain in love with the world when everything seems like it's kind of breaking apart. And it was just like an immensely moving thing to watch, especially after these past four years. I don't really have anything grand to say about it, though. I, I'm still kind of like digesting this entire day. <laughs> so yeah. I think that is grand, though. I think that's Perfect, honestly. It's it's a lot right now, so I appreciate that. Uh, this actually, so Gian, another one for you. Uh, which poem in your debut collection was hardest to write and why? Oh, geez. I feel like there's a lot of poems in here that were really painful for different ways, and there's still poems that I kind of like hide from my, um, my family <laughs> for a lot of different reasons. Um, but I would say that the poem that I still try to hide the most from my mother and like from people I love is a uh, menstruation triptych and um, caught are the ones that I, I still try to be like, oh, don't read this. <laughs> you could skip over it. 
<laughs> yeah. Um, this is, I don't know if the whole audience will be mad at me. Sometimes I like to write, I, I like to ask the unwriterly questions, right? We're all trapped at home. We have been, we will be for a little bit. I'm always curious, you know, what, what projects are you working on right now, written or otherwise, if you've gotten really into needlepoint or making your own beer or whatever you're into? Or a writing project, whatever you're up to. Am I doing anything, Jenna? <laughs> <laughs> Sharon asked if she was doing anything. <laughs> I don't think so. You're just thriving. You're just thriving in the pandemic. Well, I am planning of this not being my last reading where I will be wearing. Can you see my owl? Oh, pajamas? yes. <laughs> Those are my Incredible. pajamas. Those and are nice. being about to give a reading in owl pajamas just made me feel, you know, at home. <laughs> yeah. And since you're all friends anyway, um, it's a good feeling. It's a good feeling. <laughs> Love that. Um, so, you know, I think starting last March, I started writing these little quatrains. I was just trying to get something down. And this, I was really, I started, the first one was about Kobe Bryant, you know, and everything else happened. So I kept writing them. So now I think I have like 18 pages of this thing. So I stopped in December. I was like, okay, uh, whatever it is, it's like, you know, four lines of, couple of pages every day uh but then this happened so I'm like maybe this is the 13th month of 2020 maybe we're not in the new year yet this is what January is it's the 13th month so I'm deciding whether I should do another one because you know this is like since I've stopped writing the sonnets it's just a way to kind of keep up with everything every mm -hmm. day so I would say in terms of projects you know beggars can't be choosers I don't know what this thing will be it was just a way to write I look at it and I'm like it's 18 pages maybe when I go through it it'll really be four pages you know what I mean yeah um, so you know but it but it's something it does track the year because it was just me you know spending days writing these poems um to track what was going. so I don't know we'll see what happens but the answer was really you know whatever comes man I just whatever can happen that's what I write but I've decided no more sonnets is all um you know whatever it takes to write to write thanks I think that's yeah. so cool that without knowing each other was writing quatrains, we have both been writing quatrains. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. I was because it's two, it's two for one. You know, if you do a rhyme, as soon as you get two lines, you automatically got two more lines because you just rhyme three <laughs> right. two lines. It's double yeah. you know, double for your money. Right, right. I wouldn't be able to stop at one because for me it's a it's sort of instead of haiku uh, ballad, it's like Renku. I just yeah, no, no, it's know. not one. I mean, it was like at least twelve quatrains a day. Sometimes twenty quatrains a day. Ooh. So that's about like eighteen pages now. So none of them was, you know, it's like quatrains, I, quatrains, quatrains, tracking the whole. Well, day, then, you know. then we're twins, as I always thought. <laughs> we are. We're Scorpios, you know. That's what it is. <laughs> that's right. Uh, Gian, have you been writing quatrains as well as it's going to come out now? <laughs> I actually have not, and I'm very bummed about that all of a sudden. <laughs> Maybe I should. I've been um, dabbling in YA fiction. Um, I've been doing like a fairy tale slash ghost story retelling. I don't know if anybody's watched like the Korean horror movie, um, Tale of Two Sisters. It's um, based on like a, yes. <laughs> um, I, it's based off of like this like old um, ghost story about this like um, the sister duo. And I've been kind of dabbling in a retelling of that, which has been really fun. I've never really written fiction before. So it feels like kind of diving into something brand new and it's like this new and exciting world. So I'm having a lot of fun with that. Um, other than that, in terms of projects, I feel like I've been very much like every other person's print Pinterest. Like I've been doing an herb garden. I've been making jam, <laughs> anything to kind of like occupy my hands and stuff. I love that. My, so my fiance is watching this and I guarantee he probably just wrote down that movie. I know he just watched The Call on Netflix, that Korean horror situation. So we'll talk about this. <laughs> um, I like, so this is a good question in the chat as well. I know we have a lot of, um, Newer writers, I, I really hate the term emerging because that you can emerge at any age, however you're emerging into the world. Um, but this is a good one for people who are like getting in the work and wanna know where to go next. 
what is the best next step for a poet who has a chapbook forthcoming who wants to attend an MFA program? Are publications and journals more important than chapbooks or even a full length collection? Get into the program. That's a question about actually getting into the program. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah what, parents, go ahead. Yeah. I'm just, I'm just clearing, clearing up. Is that the question is like, what do I have to have in order to get an MFA program? Should I have a book I, or public? Yeah, I think so. I think it's like credentialing yourself into a program. If you have a chapbook forthcoming okay. and then. You got to have the best poems. And if you know that it's poets on the other side looking, like why would a group of poets always agree on anything? So you just can never know when you're applying to a program. Just remember that it's poets that are looking at it. So a poet might be like, this person's too polished. We can't help them. So you might be super professional and you won't get into a program. Somebody else will be like, this person's going to be a good success. Yeah, we're going to take them. So you just, that's how poets are. They're, you know, very unreliable judges of things, really. So. That's what I was, that tells you how slippery it is to get into places and you know, you know, who's judging it. <laughs> I had absolutely, I, I didn't actually publish anything in journals or chapbooks or otherwise when I got into NYU. So I, I really do think that it just entirely depends on the work sample and just who's viewing it. Mm -hmm. I agree. Sharon, do you want My to- My answer is yes. My answer is. It's always my answer. It's a, it's a three-part answer. We have time, don't we? No, it's very short, three-part answer. Uh, one is take your vitamins. Uh, the second part is exercise, stretch, whatever you can do, move, move. And then the third uh, has to do with being able to bear ourselves. And so my, my cure for finding it hard to bear my own company is um, kiss your wrist like this. Mwah. It helps. Oh my God, that was incredible. Did someone, I hope someone, I know we're recording this. I was gonna say, that's a book right there. Those three steps for success. That's <laughs> all you need, honestly. It doesn't guarantee success. It just makes life a little less difficult. Uh, on the difficult days, yeah. But I've been so lucky. I, I, I joke a lot and it's partly because I've, I've just had such an easy time. I love that, thank you so much. Well, here's another good, good crafty one. Uh, taking a line from one of Terence's Jasper John's pieces, your audio guide is here to help you get lost. How important is it for you all in writing a poem to pursue a thread of unknowing? And there's a second parter, but I'll, I'll stop us there. And that's a question from Maddie for you. Yeah. I spoke first last time, sure. You want me to say something? Surprise, surprise. Well, I surprise. can just jump in. I can ahead, jump in and say, someone asked me that recently. And I said, if I weren't a teacher, I wouldn't necessarily be exposed to all the mysteriousness in, uh, in the writing uh, that I get to uh, read at NYU. And I don't have a good abstract intelligence. So I've really had to um, pay attention and learn how to kind of, in a way, dance with uh, more of the unknown than my, I think, partly because I was raised on a lot of lies, my effort has been to try to find truths, which makes me kind of narrative and, you know, sort of just um, not as imaginative. It's about trying to uh, dot, dot, dot. I'm stopping there. I just said surprise, you know, is the thing. I think you're just trying to surprise yourself at every turn. So even if I say I'm writing quatrains because 50% of it I have already is to say, even if half of that is surprising because the first half was a cliche, if you follow me for four lines, that's enough. That's, that's enough to get through the day. You're just trying to find a little bit of surprise one line at a time. And sometimes it amounts to, you know, revelation, but really just you're just trying to get a little bit surprised. An inch worth of surprise, a foot's worth of surprise, a half, you know, not, don't even measure it, just like, ooh, okay, thanks. A second's worth of surprise. It's like, you know, mm -hmm. that's good. I'll take that. That's light. So that's it. You just chase the surprise. 
Yeah. Um, well, with that, there is the second part. I think you guys touched on this. Um, what are some of your favorite craft techniques for subverting your state of know about your subject or where the poem might be going? And this could be a prompt or just a, a weird little mind trick you have for all of us. I don't know. Me, I, I really like um, writing with no form in mind at first. Um, so I'll just kind of write everything. It's like a giant unruly prose block. And then depending on um, the content of the poem, I'll kind of like cleave it into whatever form I feel like works best for it. And that's like a good way of me to um, not like predictate what I want the poet to be or where I want to go. That's just what I use for myself a lot. That's great. I just think the great thing about revision is it just doesn't matter. Like, <laughs> I, I just can't be choosers. People think I'm laughing when I say that. I say I write every day, but sometimes it's just the most terrible thing because revision. Sometimes it's good if it's bad because then you got something to work on tomorrow. So I just sort of, I do come up with strategies and I can sustain them for as long as I want, you know, but if they get boring, you try to move, you don't want to be doing the same old thing. Um, but I just sort of say like, no, no rituals really, you know, the ones you can't help, sure, but you shouldn't just should be different every day, just whatever it takes, crawl into the dirt, you got a poem, great, you know, run around the block if you got a line doing that, great, doesn't mean you got to do it every day, just do it when it works. So I'm just sort of saying I, I just think uh, whatever it takes is how I write, yeah. even if it's bad, you know, because you can fix it, you can always fix it, that's what I want to emphasize, you know, revision means it just doesn't matter. Um, as long as you're writing every day, don't even judge it because you can always come back to it. I feel the same way. I write so much that no one ever sees. It's just, you know, uh, bad, but it teaches me something. And if you have two or three or four friends who are poets, who have time to write and who, and who aren't going to tell you what's wrong with your first draft, uh, but maybe just tell you what they like about one part of your first draft. This business of throwing five words, that subverts. I mean, it actually adds to the richness uh, and the nourishment because we're giving each other words. And, oh, and, and, and the five words come out of a book of poems. So someone says, well, my five words came out of this today or, or that today. And then you aren't alone when you close your compute your zoom and you take 40 minutes they're writing too that's so great thank you all this is amazing i know we only have three minutes left so I, this is the perfect question to close us out um what is feeding you now literally or figuratively I like that this is a thinker. Either you're all being polite or you're just like, what did I have for dinner? Let me remember. Well, the poems I have heard tonight have so fed and stimulated my heart, my ears, my soul. Thank you, my friends. Thank you, thank you. I feel the same way. Good night. Uh, again, you're just absorbing what you can. This was a night of poetry. It was good to hear it all. That's beautiful. Oh, Gia. I mean, what can I possibly say to you now? <laughs> I mean, that's exactly how I feel too. I was going to say soup, but after that, it feels incomprehensible. <laughs> <laughs> it's both. It's always both, you know. You need the soup and this. Well, thank you all so much. This is absolutely incredible. It is a gift to be with you and to have all of you with us. Um, remember, you can visit us at pigeonpagesnyc.com. Follow us everywhere. Um, and this is recorded so you can relive this majesty with us. And our poetry contest is going on right now. The poetry does not have to end. And thank you to Maris and McNally Jackson for having us so much. Thank it's you. Such a pleasure. Thank you all. Fun night. Thank you. Stay safe, eat soup, love each other. <laughs>